uh, we have been looking at uh, the synthetic aspects of materials in the past few lectures and uh, there is a significant divide between chemical approaches and non-chemical approaches. Uh, I have highlighted to you in one of the earlier lectures about uh, sonochemical synthesis where we use ultrasound waves to synthesize materials. Uh, in this lecture I would like to focus on microwave processing of materials and uh, mainly this is coming under the category of uh, unconventional wet chemical approach. Um, as you would see in the following slides how electromagnetic radiation can be effectively used for synthesizing materials. So, in the next few slides uh, let me highlight to you the importance of electromagnetic radiation interaction with matter and how this can be usefully exploited for making materials. <coughs> Just to familiarize yourself where we stand um, as far as this approach is concerned in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, this is the microwave region and uh, the size of wavelength is of this uh, order where it is from centimeter to millimeter uh, a size of a ant we can say and uh, the frequency is of the order of 10 power 10 to 10 power 12 therefore, it is usually categorized under um, gigahertz or megahertz and uh, one of the longer wavelength region uh, next to radio wave and therefore, this is sandwiched between radio wave and uh, infrared and uh, as you know several of this uh, electromagnetic radiations can be used uh, either in the study of uh, synthesis or in the study of spectroscopy of the uh, materials. As, as we saw from the earlier slide microwave is placed between radio wave and infrared usually the region that is of more interest for material synthesis is this 2.4 gigahertz region and uh, uh, just another mention about this electromagnetic wave is you have two vectors one is a electrical vector and a magnetic vector which are perpendicular to each other and that constitutes your electromagnetic wave. Therefore, if a material possesses some dipole then the electric field component has to interact with the matter or if the material has a moment magnetic moment then the magnetic vector of the electromagnetic radiation should interact with such a matter. So, either way when electromagnetic radiation is interacting with molecules or materials there will be some response of uh, different order. So, uh, that way uh, we will be actually using the electrical vector of the microwave radiation to interact with matter and uh, we would see in the next few slides what governs this interaction. As far as the theory of microwave heating microwaves are not ionizing radiation they are soft ok. Therefore, um, this is not a ionizing radiation, but largely this can be used to excite or uh, lift the potential energy of the molecules. So, when the potential energy of a molecule is lifted up then the kinetic energy barrier or the energy barrier that is um, restricting between the product uh, and the reactant will be lowered considerably. So, we are trying to use the potential energy of this molecules to overcome the energy barrier in order to give uh, resultant products. As you would see microwave energy is largely below the energy necessary to break bonds therefore, it is not going to make or break any bonds, but it is going to interact, but the heating effect does not come from breaking of bonds. So, if you compare the quantum energy that is available from microwave radiation let us say 2.5 gigahertz. Uh, then you are talking about a very low electron volt energy and this energy is not sufficient to break any bonds. For example, think of uh, hydrogen oxygen bond 5.2 E V or hydrogen uh, bonding in water is of 0.21. So, even it cannot overcome the hydrogen bond therefore, 
uh, the secondary effects of microwave interaction with matter is what is going to bring about synthesis therefore this is not a bond making or a cleaving process. Uh, <clears throat> so when we think of uh, the wavelength of such microwaves you can uh, you can think of uh, the dimensions to be uh, 1 millimeter to 1 meter that is why in conventional microwave ovens that we have in our kitchen you actually have a perforation a metal foil in front of uh, you uh, which is uh, which is having very fine holes less than 1 millimeter so as to give you some transparency for you to see what is going on inside at the same time it will avoid the leak of the microwave from coming out of the uh, commercial oven. Uh, frequency allowed for commercial and medical and scientific application is of this order therefore it will not easily come through this small openings that is available in the uh, conventional uh, um, or commercial uh, ovens. Um, there are uh, many ways that we can interpret the heating but there are two specific causes by which microwave heating can be achieved. As you know um, the, uh, the molecule when you keep a molecule in a electrical uh, field um, let us say H nu then the molecule actually undergoes deformation in other words there is polarization suppose it is in the axis um, molecular axis then this particular molecule will deform like this and thereby it will induce a polarization. So, the molecule will actually deform uh, in the axis uh, molecular axis when light is applied therefore there is a polarization in this form and suppose we apply the um, light in this uh, direction electromagnetic radiation then the deformation will happen in this form. In any way we actually have a polarization that is induced and this is anisotropic in nature. So, this dipole will actually rotate or this di dipole will oscillate with the microwave frequency as a result there will be interaction between the material molecule or um, uh, any solid for that matter with the matter and once dipole is in introduced it will bring about a net polarization and this net polarization is the governing factor for in the interaction of microwave energy with the material and therefore there will be two mechanisms which will actually govern we will see in the next few slides. So, the frequency dependence of the several contributions to polarizability can be mapped up this way the power loss microwave power is therefore proportional to the electric field and alpha comes as a proportionality constant where alpha is nothing but polarization or polarizability and this net polarization is actually governed by three factors one is dipolar polar polarizability and ionic polarizability and electronic polarizability but if you actually look at the frequency mapping and what are all the uh, polarizability factors that become active in the microwave region so if you look at the microwave region here the dipolar and ionic contributions are maximum and therefore, the uh, interactions of uh, the microwave radiation with matter is principally uh, governed by these two mechanisms. Uh, so, dipole rotation is uh, to do with uh, the dipole that is oscillating in a molecule when it is kept in an electric field or it could be the ions that are coupling with the electromagnetic radiation and therefore, they will oscillate according to the frequency alignment with the oscillating electric field and therefore, there is loss of energy in the form of heat which forms the mechanism. The animation of this uh, is given in the, in this cartoon as you can see here when microwaves come the uh, dipoles actually oscillate in this fashion they do not rotate, but they oscillate with the phase. So, when you bring any molecule in phase with the frequency of your microwave then they start oscillating with the uh, keeping phase with the electromagnetic radiation. So, this is to do with uh, dipolar polarization and in the case of uh, uh, conduction mechanism it is the ions that uh, oscillate with the electromagnetic radiation. In either case as you would see here this oscillation actually brings about 
frictional force. So, when there is frictional force with the neighboring molecules, there comes heating. So, this is not a breaking of bond, but the heating actually comes from frictional force that is coming from the dangling of these uh, bonds. As a result, a local heating is generated. So, this local heating actually maximizes a, uh, a uniform heating in the whole, uh, in the whole uh, material rather than the heating coming from one particular direction. Therefore, uh, this particular heating effect that is generated due to a uh, uh, microwave is much more special than any other form of heating. Uh, so, this is another way that we can construe how this uh, water is getting heated in a conventional microwave if you just put water within 30 seconds or so you get it boiling hot and this is how it is there is a, a permanent dipole uh, here. Uh, be, because of this uh, polarization of charges and uh, this this is the axis perpendicular uh, uh, to the molecular axis and uh, molecules actually will be rotating in this fashion. So, molecules will rotate and then again it will go back. So, it is more of oscillation not a continuous rotation it is more of oscillation of this form and this oscillation will actually hit other neighboring water molecules. So, when there is a global uh, uh, effect where all the water molecules are oscillating with each other then the frictional force actually brings about the heating and same is true for uh, the ions. So, the ions do also oscillate in phase with the microwave radiation producing heating. So, when we think about this heating can do we have any numbers that we can look at and uh, what is the uh, factor that governs the uh, heating of these materials. There are three parameters that we should bear in mind and uh, we need to moderate this in order to get maximum uh, heating effect. One is dielectric constant E prime and this is to do with the material itself that is interacting with microwave and uh, this dielectric constant is dependent on the polarizing level of a molecule in a electromagnetic field. Sometimes if you have a molecule with a permanent dipole then already it is polar therefore, it will couple, but if you have some molecules may be um, uh, may be uh, non polar molecules or aprotic molecules then those will actually have a induced dipole moment in the microwave therefore, that will also interact. So, the essential factor is the epsilon uh, or, or E prime which will uh, which is unique of the material itself. And the second factor is dielectric loss E double prime and this is the efficiency of the microwave conversion in uh, into heat and this uh, E double prime is nothing but conductivity over frequency conductivity over frequency and therefore, we can call uh, or we can have a measure by which the interaction of the microwave radiation with the material can be gauged and this is given by tan delta and this tan delta is nothing but E double prime over epsilon prime. So, this is called as tangential loss or loss tangent and loss tangent is nothing but the material capability to absorb microwave. So, if loss tangent is approximately uh, close to unity then you say that is maximum capability of the material to absorb. Suppose, it is less than uh, uh, 0.1 then it is a material which will couple very poorly. So, if you have a data for tangential loss then you can easily map what sort of material can be used for the reaction and you can fine tune on the frequency to, uh, to affect this. Uh, in case of uh, polar compounds actually your conductivity is more compared to um, omega therefore, uh, your tan delta will be very close to 1. So, the dielectric parameters are governed by this equation as we saw tan delta is equal to E double prime by E prime we call this as dielectric loss and we call this as dielectric constant of the material and this is the loss tangent and if you can map several of these um, compounds which coupled with microwave we we have three 
um, categories one is strongly coupled uh, molecules and uh, the one which tops the uh, order is ethylene glycol where the tan delta is of the order of 1.350 okay so uh, and as you would see these are all polar compounds most of these polar compounds are very close to unity therefore these are best microwave absorbers but if you go further down you can see the region where there are some molecules or organic solvents which are mediumly coupled so therefore they may not really bring about the necessary heating effect as you would see and there are other ones which are very reluctant to couple with microwave therefore uh, the tan delta value gives us a measure of what set of um, combinations that you can choose for microwave synthesis. Um, here are some more materials which gives you the tangential loss factor uh, as you would see here uh, water is a better candidate compared to uh, some of the polymers here and the teflon for that matter teflon is uh, very reluctant therefore teflon can be used as an inert material even to conduct uh, many of the reactions uh, for that matter in conventional microwave synthesis teflon tubes are used or teflon uh, boards are used or teflon bombs are used so that uh, mainly because they do not interact with microwave so this can be used as a substrate or a holder for conducting reactions so uh, the tangential uh, loss uh, factor is one measure by which we can gauge what set of material can interact with microwave. Now when we look at this dielectric heating we need to understand that uh, the dielectric heating really brings about a, a drastic change compared to uh, the conventional heating. Uh, for those uh, who are familiar with organic synthesis usually all the reactions are conducted in oil bath or in sulfuric acid bath because you can go up to 350 degree uh, centigrade maximum to conduct your reactions. But if you look at the zone that you try to generate usually um, there is a gradient here and uh, uh, temperature gradient is uh, maximum in this region and you do not see uh, the voluminous heating that, that is happening in a conventional oil bath or even if you have a uh, electro heating furnace um, the uh, heating will come from all sides and therefore the there will be a, a clear temperature gradient and the voluminous heating cannot be achieved whereas in the case of microwave because it depends on the dielectric parameters of the material there is voluminous heating in in the material and therefore uh, there is no temperature gradient that you would see and as a result if you are looking for any phase separation or any other possible impurity formation this this can be very easily avoided in microwave heating compared to electro heating. So this is a very very crucial dividing principle between microwave heating process and the conventional process which really makes this a very good candidate to try a variety of uh, reactions. So, uh, when we think of using this microwave uh, heating for uh, synthesis we need to understand what can be the holder what can be the vessel in which we can use therefore we should use a vessel which is actually transparent to microwave which means it does not interact with, uh, uh, with microwave so it will allow the material to uh, microwave to pass through but react only with the sample therefore if you have a low loss insulator for example and this low loss insulators are um, transparent to microwave as a result the penetration is total okay. So glass for example or any ceramics they are uh, transparent to microwave so heating can be very well achieved. So crucibles of glass or uh, something made of silica or alumina this can act as a very good agent even teflon can act as a very good agent for microwave to go through metals actually coupled with microwave therefore they are opaque it would not allow the microwave to pass through so it gets reflected <coughs> and that is why you have a shield in your uh, commercial microwave 
uh, which is a metal shield therefore, it will actually reflect the microwave to the center of the uh, cavity as a result the material that you want to heat can be effectively heated therefore, micro uh, metal is a uh, uh, opaque uh, a candidate and uh, as far as the absorbers are concerned lossy insulators can allow partially the microwave to go as you would see it propagates, but then it gets dampened and therefore, the penetration is partial to total or if you have in such lossy insulators some metal ingredients like this as you would see here, then this can actually allow um, microwave to get absorbed and therefore, you can achieve a partial or total penetration. So, uh, this gives us some uh, idea about the range of material that I can choose those which are opaque to microwave and those which are uh, transparent to microwave. And as a result we can say reflective ones are metals water is a very absorptive metal and uh, uh, those which are transparent to microwaves are polymers. Polymeric stuffs are uh, microwave uh, transparent therefore, you can use that as uh, containers. Now, every kind of reaction performed under classical heating methods can be performed under microwave radiation therefore, um, this sort of chemical uh, synthesis is actually categorized as microwave assisted reactions and in mi microwave assisted reaction you can aim for both so solution approach as well as solid solution approach. So, uh, if you want solid state um, reactions that is also possible uh, suppose you are bringing two solids and this has to be uh, formed usually such reactions are aimed uh, aimed at uh, under sealed vacuum conditions. So, vacuum sealed capsules can be used for bringing about solid state reactions to bring uh, uh, the solid solid interaction into closer proximity because usually when uh, solids coupled with microwave there will be a plasma generated and this plasma can bring about a voluminous heating and therefore, this is done in seal tube experiments mostly. For volumetric heating, so we can actually go for any sort of reactions there neat reagents are uh, uh, possible as well as solid supports are possible. So, variety of solid state reactions can be achieved similarly. Uh, solutions we can try with apolar solvents or aprotic solvents and polar solvents. In case of apolar solvents we need to induce some sort of microwave susceptors which will actually bring about the microwave coupling therefore, uh, either of this range can be achieved. So, what are the advantages of uh, microwave heating why we have to use microwave heating number one it is uh, reduced uh, reaction time or uh, if you think about sintering we I will come to this issue uh, later in some of the examples we can uh, tremendously lower the reaction time scale and uh, we can also avoid side reactions therefore, microwave heating is uh, more selective and specially in organic synthesis uh, in today's lecture I will not be able to give you more examples on organic synthesis I will concentrate more on inorganic materials. And another thing is it is uh, more specific uh, in nature and therefore, increases the yield of the reaction and uh, it gives improved reproducibility and also increase density of film when we try for uh, some uh, film fabrication approaches. So, when you look at uh, microwave effects uh, one of the main ingredients there is the thermal effect in this microwave heating and uh, which achieves a uh, high reaction temperature at high heating rate and therefore, it affects the uh, energy of activation. So, the reaction rate can be uh, fastened by orders of magnitude. So, because of this we try to use the thermal effects as an uh, as a source to speed up the reaction and uh, the way that we can do that is of two forms either we can go for a single mode uh, cavity instrument or multi mode instrument. What we have in 
our kitchen microwave is actually a multi mode instrument where you have a magnetron which will uh, which will generate your microwave and this is uh, this is guided by a waveguide and this will finally lead to uh, a open cavity where it will be confined it will get scattered everywhere but then reflected so as to concentrate only on the sample so this is a, a multi mode cavitation um, and single mode uh, instruments are also available where you generate microwave and this is actually channelized through a waveguide only to hit at a particular sample for organic reactions this sort of single mode cavity instruments are also possible i will show one or two commercial instruments which can do the job and uh, as you would see um, microwave is also the source material for electron spin resonance where um, a magnetron will generate a microwave and that is actually guided through a waveguide to the sample. So, the single mode instruments are already in use, but multi mode instruments actually helps us with larger amount of samples. There are different versions of uh, microwaves that are available. Uh, I do not mean to promote only multi synth equipments, uh, but there are several other commercial instruments that are available. I will show some uh, which are used in uh, our own laboratory for reference, but uh, this is a very good sum up to show what set of features can be achieved. We can go for mono or multi mode using this set of a uh, um, cavity and if, uh, if you look at the uh, inside view picture you can actually do a scale up of that with the many um, containers here. So, you can uh, you can go for a easy scale up in a parallel fashion and uh, you can also engineer open vessel reactions uh, for for example, these are for open vessel synthesis these are Teflon bombs that can be used for uh, high pressure vessel studies as you uh, you can see this can be kept inside a bomb and then uh, can be mounted here. So, this this looks more like a lab station where you can have a parallel synthesis of several uh, units of your sample tubes uh, placed simultaneously and therefore, you can uh, scale it very easily. Uh, so, from a simple uh, multi mode cavity you can achieve many things one you can look this more like a muffled furnace, but then uh, you can do open system reactions uh, if you want to you can even purge uh, the system with gas. So, this is possible or you can do closed system as you can see this is confined uh, to a bomb and we can try to measure the uh, pressure release there. Uh, so, parallel screening can be made uh, and uh, Teflon bombs can be housed like this. So, either you can do a open system or closed system uh, reactions and uh, the bus word here in microwave heating is the shorter uh, reaction scales uh, reaction time and as a result the solution actually uh, gets a uniform uh, heating. So, we can go for uh, any sort of uh, reactions that uh, that we are looking for, but when we come to uh, solids uh, we need to understand that uh, it is not as simple as the solution process as you would see here this is a good example of a glass ceramic and uh, this is a hot pressed uh, boron nitride this is alumina this is silica and uh, this is uh, again uh, 99 percent alumina. In all this if you look at the tangential loss factor these are very low and uh, you need to expose these materials for a, a longer uh, time scale in order to really achieve a considerable amount of microwave absorption and this region in uh, such insulators is actually referred to as thermal runway. This is called thermal runaway meaning um, there would not be effective coupling of microwave with this material until you generate a minimum ener uh, energy or temperature only after the sample reaches say 600 or 700 degrees uh, centigrade then you will be able to scale up or maximize on the coupling and therefore, um, when you when you look at the uh, uh, insulating um, oxides uh, one of the or ceramics in general 
one of the important thing that we need to understand is it is not as quick and fast as solution route. Therefore, this thermal runaway is a very important parameter when we when we are looking at solids when they interact with matter. So, I will take you through some of the examples from now on. Uh, some of the examples are from our own uh, group and uh, let me first start with those examples. The one thing that is very popularly used nowadays is microwave coupled polyol reaction and this is a commercial instrument that we have from CEM corporation USA and this is a Voyager a unit which actually has um, a magnetron which is designed in such a way that you can get the microwave focus to the center of the cavity here. So, this you will get a voluminous heating only thing the size restriction is there but you can actually use it for both open vessel as well as well as closed vessel reaction and this is the way you can uh, generate the microwave concentrating on the middle of the sample region. So, let me take a uh, issue of uh, zinc oxide uh, formation and we can do alloying of this zinc oxide either with cadmium doping or with magnesium doping and as you would see here the reaction is very simple you can start with the nitrate uh, either zinc nitrate or magnesium nitrate and cadmium nitrate as you uh, would desire and uh, you can uh, use urea urea to hydrolyze and uh, ethylene glycol is both used for um, hydrolyzing plus as a solvent as you as you have seen in one of the previous slides ethylene glycol is actually um, having a strong uh, tangential loss and therefore, this is a very good solvent that can be used for uh, reactions. So, in this example I will show you how size dependent photoluminescent properties can be uh, generated in dumbbell shaped zinc oxide uh, multipots prepared by microwave assisted polyol route. As you would see here uh, <coughs> polyol synthesis involves high boiling alcohols with more hydroxyl groups more the hydroxyl groups then the tangential loss gets maximized. Therefore, the alcohol can do two jobs one is to reduce and the other one is to act as a solvent and the mechanism is proposed via two types one is crystallization of the metal hydroxides and dissolution of the metal hydroxides and further reduction by alcohol to give corresponding metal uh, nanoparticles. Okay. So, uh, Let us take the case of a simple uh, reaction of zinc oxide before we consider cadmium and magnesium doping. So, I can actually vary the exposure of this mixture to 1 hour to 6 hours and then look at the property to understand what really is important. Now, in this case you can see 1 hour exposure, 2 hour exposure and 6 hour exposure gives very highly crystalline zinc oxide powders. So, there is no doubt from uh, the x-ray uh, mapping that you can see this uh, uh, typical hexagonal pattern that is coming out. Therefore, you would not like to doubt on the x-ray purity or the composition of this oxide, but what you should understand that the exposure does control the particle size and as a result the other properties can also get altered and that is what you would see from the other uh, cartoon here. Uh, at 1 hour you can see that they are almost forming uh, sort of pot, uh, multi pots of zinc oxide and you do not seem to see any uh, secondary effects or any phase separation here. Therefore, these are quite impressive 1 hour and at 2 hours seemingly these multi pots have grown in size, but when you go to 4 hours and 6 hours the sort of length scale of this multi pots are vanishing and they are going more into smaller crystallites when you go for uh, 6 hour time scale. So, um, does this growth factor or the shape, uh, shape and size of the uh, zinc oxide nano rods do they have any influence on the property. If you look at the absorbance for a 2 hour exposed mixture and a 4 hour exposed mixture you would see the optical band gap is nearly the same. So, you would not uh, think that there is anything uh, extraordinary happening, 
but if you look at the photoluminescence spectra of the 2 r sintered uh, 2 r exposed and 4 r exposed mixture you can clearly see the photoluminescence is totally different. In 2 r exposed case you get a very characteristic sharp 380 nanometer uh, band which is nothing but your band to band emission emission and this is exactly what is uh, needed as far as zinc oxides are concerned. But when you expose it further the subsequent nucleation actually brings about defect chemistry into zinc oxide as a result you do not see this uh, 380 na nanometer peak, but you see a dominant surface induced defect induced emission as a result you do not see this characteristic 380 nanometer peak anymore. Therefore, uh, the way you uh, expose the uh, mixture or the starting material to microwave uh, it may not show macroscopically any defects, but it subsequently will induce some amount of defect chemistry into it. Therefore, this study would help us to understand how much of microwave exposure is needed to control the physical properties. As you would see uh, the growth of this multipods are also kinematic in nature. Uh, initially this zinc oxide nuclei are formed and uh, this uh, they form uh, subsequently single um, nano rods and this nano rods get fused like a dumbbell shaped ones and this dumbbell shaped rods further they get fused like this fashion into multi rods and all this is uh, kinetically controlled and therefore, if you want to stop the defect chemistry then you need to stop at a particular size. If you go for um, a very long exposure probably you will get very interesting facets of uh, zinc oxide rods, but essentially they lack in clarity as far as the photoluminescent property is concerned. Similarly, uh, for cadmium let us say if you we can achieve easily doping for 20 percent and 50 percent cadmium uh, oxide and uh, x-ray will not give you any clue, but once you see here the carefully the SEM feature these are all uh, zinc oxide rods you can see the hexagonal feature on the top of this uh, rod, but for 50 percent you do not see the same morphology and if you carefully look at the decomposition temperature and the heat of formation of these oxides we can get a clue for zinc oxide the decomposition temperature of zinc hy uh, hydroxide is only 125 degree uh, and therefore, it is very easy for us to get zinc oxide nano rods. Whereas, when we dope cadmium uh, into it cadmium hydroxide is initially formed and for cadmium hydroxide to get subsequently reduced to cadmium oxide it is very reluctant because the temperature that is needed is 232. As a result what you see in the previous view graph this is nothing but cadmium hydroxide and this is totally segregated out as a result you do and this is amorphous in nature. So, it will not show off in your x-ray as a impurity peak there therefore, we need to take care as to how the decomposition temperatures uh, can affect the final oxide formation. I will show in the next few slides uh, uh, another example of magnesium hydroxide doping in zinc oxide. Uh, in the next example we can again uh, look at another issue of magnesium doped into zinc uh, oxide. Uh, zinc oxide is hexagonal in nature therefore, when you look at uh, magnesium doping any segregation of magnesium oxide will come out as a cubic phase then you can easily map, but what we see in reality is when you use polyol synthesis you again see a very highly crystalline zinc oxide with no uh, presence of magnesium hydroxide. And uh, if you look at the uh, TEM it does not show any phase segregation. So, one can actually confuse uh, this to be a solid solution of magnesium oxide in zinc oxide, but what you see in, in effect is magnesium hydroxide is getting formed and because in as I showed in the earlier uh, slide magnesium hydroxide decomposition is only at 350 whereas, zinc hydroxide is forming at 125 degree C. Now, when you 
try to dope any amount of magnesium hydroxide this actually gets surface coated on the zinc oxide nano rods and therefore, because uh, magnesium hydroxide is amorphous in nature you would only see the zinc uh, hydroxide uh, sorry zinc oxide nano rod pattern and you would not see any presence of a phase separation. Whereas, if you try to heat this uh, zinc oxide rods which are coated with magnesium hydroxide then at 100,000 degree C this gets converted into magnesium oxide and then this magnesium oxide gets partially doped into zinc oxide which you can see from your PL slowly the bandage is actually going from, um, uh, from 380 down to 240 or so with a blue shift uh, uh, in the absorbance. So, we need to have an idea about the individual decomposition of this uh, hydroxides so as to map for effective doping of this solid solutions. There are many examples from other groups which I would like to quote one is inorganic synthesis of nanoparticles let us take the example of uh, platinum and ruthenium nanoparticles these are used for variety of purpose and again here ethylene glycol can be used in a conventional heating actually this would require um, a reflex at 160 degree for 3 hours whereas in microwave the whole reaction can be completed in just 15 minutes exposure therefore you can speed up this reaction not only that this platinum ruthenium catalyst show a very different uh, behavior look at the x-ray analysis. So, x-ray analysis of platinum ruthenium which is exposed to microwave clearly shows a very different x-ray compared to the conventional heating procedure where here you see uh, PTRUO4 type of a uh, x-ray pattern which is highly crystalline whereas, in this case you see a um, broad uh, or x-ray broadening uh, in this uh, peaks uh, which is indicative of nano size. So, whenever there is x-ray broadening you talk about uh, a nano size regime and that is the reason why it is not highly crystalline. So, if you look carefully at the TM pictures both the pictures here enlarged versions there is more agglomeration in the case of uh, conventional heating method where there are you see very dark patches whereas, the particles are much thinner and finer and nearly separated in the case of microwave sintered samples. Therefore, uh, making nano materials microwave can still perform a better job co compared to conventional heating and if you want to make cobalt ferrite for example, take cobalt chloride and iron chloride and if we can expose this to microwave by reducing it with ammonia then you can see the difference between conventional heating and microwave heating. So, if you are going to employ conventional heating you can see that it is poorly mapping whereas, in the case of uh, microwave heated uh, reactions it is faster and then you get the single phase without any problem. So, you can make uh, spinal compounds using simple reduction technique and then you can isolate the uh, final product with much ease. You should also realize making such uh, spinal phase materials in solid state actually requires temperature more than 800 degree C where you can speed it up in no time. So, microwave can be used for such reactions and also microwave for thermal uh, hydrothermal synthesis microwave can be used as a, so a heating source than a furnace for making silicon crystals and as you would see here exposure to microwave you can crystallize this particles in a much more uh, clearer way. Another good application which actually can prove very cost effective is functionalizing carbon nanotubes and uh, carbon nanotubes as you see here this is the G band and D band of the carbon nanotubes and as received and the microwave exposed. So, the microwave exposed are showing a very clearer D band which is due to uh, the influence of microwave and also compared to the as prepared carbon nanotubes those which are exposed to different exposure levels of microwave clearly show that the carbon nanotubes can be 
functionalize with ease. Otherwise, the conventional um, heating technique usually involves boiling it with nitric acid for a very long time. But digestion in microwave uh, appears to be a very economic and a very facile route to functionalize the carbon nanotubes. Therefore, this can be extended for functionalizing uh, carbon and nanotubes. Apart from synthesis, we can also use microwave for sintering purpose. As you know, sintering is a very long phenomena and it takes days, sometimes several hours for sinter, sintering any compound. When I mean sintering, we are making powder compacts and that can be uh, sintered or that can be densified to theoretical density. So, that is densification up to theoretical and that is the uh, use of sintering uh, powder compacts. So, uh, I will show uh, the um, facile nature of microwave process how we can uh, achieve all this in uh, in a faster rate. This is one of our uh, groups work way back uh, this is published in physical review B where we have tried to <coughs> synthesize a variety of uh, silver selenide compounds using microwave. Silver and selenium they couple with microwave very easily, but this uh, compound cannot be made in open vessel. Therefore, this is a sealed tube experiment that you can try to do and with different concentration of uh, silver we can try to look at the magneto resistance uh, ratios. As you would see here um, all the compounds with silver variation can be achieved and a systematic change in the resistance versus temperature is also noted with a very clear dependency on silver composition. There is a systematic variation as you would see the insulator to metal transition is noted in silver selenide compounds and one important point is when we take silver and selenium and mix it and make this sort of cylindrical compacts and then put this in a sealed tube and we try to expose it there will be very bright flashes coming in this uh, uh, vessel which will not only yield silver selenide formation, but it will also densify the compact. Densify the compact to such an extent this is the SEM uh, image of the silver selenide that you would see there is no porosity absolutely more than 99 percent uh, theoretical density can be achieved simultaneously. So, this is one of a classic example of using microwave sintering not only you can prepare, but simultaneously sinter the compound to the final product. So, this is a, an example and as you would see if you take a EPMA electron probe micro analysis of this to map only selenium distribution just to see whether selenium has segregated or it is uh, uniformly distributed all these minute spots that you would see here this is <coughs> due to selenium uh, mapping which means selenium is equally distributed in this short period. So, Silver selenide formation is a very classic example of doing both the synthesis and sintering together at the same time which is a very versatile uh, route to uh, synthesize uh, products. And uh, in sintering one uh, of ceramics for example, one of the important problem that we encounter is taking out the binder out of the matrix and then densifying it. As you would see here conventional synthesis the binder usually it is PVA that is used polyvinyl alcohol say 2 percent of polyvinyl alcohol is actually taken to a ceramic uh, pellet like this and it is actually heated. So, to densify. So, this PVA has to be first removed before it goes through a size reduction and as you would see microwave assisted synthesis actually takes out the uh, polymer binder in a much more facile way compared to conventional route. And also the linear shrinkage mapping that is the densification can be easily achieved using microwave uh, reaction compared to conventional process. 
and uh, this is another example of uh, titania nanoparticles uh, which are sintered using microwave uh, uh, approach compared to normal sintering as you could see here these mono sized grains are intact and uh, they are more uniform and uh, uh, better densification is achieved compared to normal sintering. So, microwave sintering is uh, comparably much more effective and also if you look at uh, sintering of alloys of uh, multi component alloys uh, the sintering uh, using microwave is much more uh, uniform and with smaller grains compared to conventional uh, stuff because grain boundary and grain size can largely affect the properties of the final product. Therefore, you seem to get a controlled uh, grain size uh, growth in microwave which can be exploited uh, for device purposes. And there is another example of how uh, microwave and uh, con conventionally sintered alloys can uh, work out as you would see in the microwave case there is not much phase separation only one particular phase is promoted during sintering whereas in the conventional case you see various phases are emerging out this is because of inhomogeneous heating or uh, there is no volumetric heating therefore this phase separations occur as you are taking the uh, temperature from low temperature to very high temperatures. So, um, a conclusion on uh, microwave sintering uh, is my, uh, it can be successfully used uh, for a range of materials including metal powders. Uh, advantage of the technique include significantly faster heating rates, lower sintering temperatures and enhanced classification and controlled grain growth. Uh, therefore, uh, microwave uh, one of the main application in inorganic uh, uh, materials is to do with sintering. Uh, we can also initiate uh, uh, high temperature reactions without a furnace um, and I have discussed this in uh, other modules also, but let me quote one example uh, before I make uh, some conclusion. Case of forming high temperature cubic phase of zirconia we can try to achieve using uh, microwave. How do we do that? We take a zirconyl nitrate and uh, we can use urea or carbohydrate or any of the fuels and uh, this would actually give us uh, zirconia nanoparticles and this zirconia nanoparticles can either be cubic or tetragonal or monoclinic either of this as you would see from this microwave uh, initiated reactions you always get the high temperature phase. So, therefore, uh, you uh, microwave can be used to completely avoid a furnace heating and as you would see here very clearly that uh, cubic uh, uh, zirconia phase is formed and you can even dope cobalt in this case up to 30 40 percent with convenience without any impurity phase. And uh, this is the typical magnetic curve for uh, ZRO2 which shows a diamagnetic signal whereas a 10 percent cobalt doped one shows a very clear hysteresis. So, you can achieve uh, high temperature phases uh, in no time using combustion and these are other view graphs which tells us that uh, such uh, magnetic phases can be very conveniently prepared and all this can be done in less than 5 minutes time uh, because it undergoes a high temperature combustion reaction. So, to conclude uh, let me uh, uh, bring out few things. Uh, typically microwave energy decreases the kinetic energy barrier for reaction by altering bond vibrational um, energies uh, of specific reactants. It also provides an expanded re reaction range with lower temperatures and uh, reaction times which uh, can obviously avoid side reactions and uh, this can lead to lot of cost savings. So, this is one of the main advantage and compared with conventional methods microwave synthesis has advantage of very short reaction time production of small particles with narrow size distribution and high purity. For those of uh, the hearers I am um, just confining or limiting the uh, use of microwave only to inorganic materials, but it is a big ocean because more than uh, 10,000 papers are recorded on microwave synthesis alone where variety of organic synthesis has been achieved 
and uh, in organic synthesis usually it is the selectivity and the yield which is very important and this has been enhanced using uh, uh, microwave synthesis. So, for those who are interested in organic synthesis you can go to uh, many of the websites and the uh, published papers which will give you a classic outlook about how microwaves can be used for organic reactions also.